the right place if you're looking for amplifying their voices and choices. Um, we're talking about total communication today and especially thinking about individuals with CVI or cerebral cortical visual impairment. So as a quick introduction, my name is Sylvia Mangan. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm blonde. I have glasses on and a black blazer and a shirt that was kindly decorated with lunch by my son. So, and if you hear a baby, that's probably him. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, but we're here to talk about our kids and my kid is here today. Um, my history is as a speech language pathologist and I loved joining the team here at Perkins, learning about CVI. And that really ignited a passion for me of working with these complex communicators, especially who have CVI. I did the CVI certificate at UMass Boston and now I'm becoming a TVI. I'm at the same institution enrolled in their TVI program. Um, one of my favorite things is to collaborate with families and professionals to make communication and learning as accessible as possible for these incredible, um, incredible students. So thanks for journeying with me today. As a brief outline of our time together, I'm going to start by defining our terms. I have three big ones that we're going to go through. We're going to talk about total communication, what CVI is, and what the Communication Bill of Rights is. And then we're going to talk about why that Bill of Rights matters and how it's difficult to access those rights when you have CVI. And we're only going to go through seven of them because we don't have all day. It's already 3.30. Um, and we'll have some case studies, some solutions, some ideas, some, some take-home ideas for you. <clears throat> So to get us started, what is total communication? Total communication, there's a lot of definitions out there, but the National Council for Special Education in Ireland has a nice one. Um, a total communication approach involves using and accepting all types of communication, not just speech equally. And that may include facial expressions, body language, gesture, sign, sound, symbols, written language, pictures, objects of reference, and electronic aids. It could be anything, right? And in this way, we want to encourage our students to use whatever means they need to share their wants, their needs, their ideas, their social connections. And so in this uh, picture on the slide, we have a 14-year-old girl in our lower school checking out some tangible symbols, which is one of her key communication aids. And that's how she is a total communicator. And really at the heart of it, total communication honors all kinds of voices, whatever voice you have, whether it's spoken language or whether it's pictures or an output device, we want to honor that and encourage that and encourage the agency to choose which kind of communication that student needs in the moment. All right, on to CVI. This is what I live and breathe all day, everybody. So I could talk about this for hours. I'm gonna try to keep it really concise and short, um, but CVI, is a brain-based visual impairment instead of being based in the eye, and it's caused by damage or interruption to the visual pathways or visual processing areas of the brain. And so it is the leading cause of childhood blindness and low vision, but it remains poorly, un poorly understood and likely underdiagnosed. It's characterized by functional vision problems, so issues with how they use your, their vision that cannot be adequately, adequately explained by the structural problem with the eye. So this means it's the visual centers of the brain that have difficulty processing and interpreting the visual information. So it's an issue of the brain, not necessarily the eyes, maybe the eyes as well, um, but it's more of an issue of processing and understanding what you're looking at, or even being able to attend to what you want to look at. People with CVI often display common visual behaviors and traits, but it is so not one size fits all. <laughs> CVI manifests differently in everyone. And there are no two people with CVI who have the same lived experience, and the NEI and the NIH have identified CVI as a growing need. And I have a link on the slide that you can look into this further. It is so exciting to see this uh, diagnosis finally being recognized as a matter of urgency by our leading government agencies now. Um, so there is some fire behind uh, the movement now and we're so excited to see it growing. So uh, at Perkins, we've outlined these 16 visual behaviors. We're not gonna go into all of them today, don't worry. Um, but these 16 visual behaviors outline generally how CVI manifests in people. They have different, I like to call them a, a CVI mixing board of sound. Everyone has a different kind of manifestation and interaction of these, but these 16 visual behaviors are grounded in peer-reviewed research 
and generally describe how individuals with CVI access their world visually. So we're gonna break down some of these as we talk about the Communication Bill of Rights. So what is the Communication Bill of Rights? There's some really important history here. It's kind of old, it's from the mid nineties, but back in the nineties, a group of organizations came together and found that well-intended educational practices were removing key rights from these complex communicators. They found that in the name of behavior management and in the name of keeping kids quiet and complicit, there were a lot of rights being denied to these students with complex communication needs. Their communication systems were being taken away as punishment when we all need access to our voice at all times. If there's a speaking child, you're not gonna put duct tape over his mouth if they're misbehaving. But if you take away someone's communication device, it's essentially the same thing. So this group of organizations came together and outlined a bill of rights specifically for communication in order to counter affect these practices that were really discriminatory just because these students, these children couldn't speak and couldn't advocate for themselves. Again, well-intended and in the name of having students quiet and working hard, which I understand is a goal for many educators, um, but it took away their voices. And so this group came together and made outlined this Bill of Rights. And the purpose of this group, which is a mouthful, but it's the National Joint Committee for the Communication Needs of Persons with Severe Disabilities, or the NJC. Um, the purpose of the NJC is to advocate for individuals with significant communication support needs resulting from intellectual disability that may coexist with autism, sensory, and or motor limitation. The NJC is made up of representatives from eight member organizations and focuses on research, policy, practice, and education. As I mentioned, this was a little while ago. I would love to see a revamp of these that actually has individuals with disabilities at the table because the people who wrote this were the professionals and the teachers and the parents working with those individuals, but it, the individuals themselves did not have a voice at the table. So if you see a, an opportunity to encourage people towards that, I would love to see these revamped with individuals with, with complex communication needs actually weighing in on them. But what we have, it's still pretty good. <laughs> I think it's still some good guidelines for us. I have these as a handout. We have them up here on the front table. I have them in multiple formats, braille, large print. I can send them to you if you need it as a screen reader. And I also have it as a poster that someone adapted and put on Teachers Pay Teachers um, so that I have it up at my desk so that I can always be reminded what are the rights that my students have. So the ones on the screen that are highlighted in blue are the ones that we're gonna dive into later. But I just wanna make sure that I read through all of these. Um, and if you have questions, throw your hand up um, or put it in the chat if you're on Zoom and I'm really happy to pause and talk about it. Or I might say, hold on, that's one we're gonna talk about later. All right, so first, the first right is that these individuals have the right to interact socially, maintain social closeness and build relationships. Second, they have the right to request desired objects, actions, events, and people. The right to refuse or reject undesired objects, actions, events, or choices. The right to express personal preferences and feelings. The right to make choices from meaningful alternatives. The right to make comments and share opinions. The right to ask for and give information, including information about changes in routine and environment the right to be informed about people and events in one's life. They also have the right to access interventions and support that improves communication, the right to have communication acts acknowledged and responded to even when the desired outcome cannot be realized, the right to have access to functioning AAC, augmentative and alternative communication and other AT, which is assistive technology, services and devices at all times. The amount of times I've had a student come to speech with a device that has no battery left is frequent. <laughs> and I think that this is a common occurrence for many people. So we still don't have this one figured out. The right to access environmental contexts, interactions, and opportunities that promote participation as full communication partners with other people, including their peers. The right to be treated with dignity and addressed with respect and courtesy the right to be addressed directly and not be spoken for or talked about in the third person while present, and the right to have clear, meaningful, and culturally and linguistically appropriate communications. 
wow, that's 15. That's a lot, right? <laughs> but it's so vital and important when you think about how we interact with our world, if we're speaking communicators, uh, we want that same agency, that same respect, and the same opportunities for those of us who are non-speaking. So if you want a simpler version, like I said, there's some printed out in this um, poster version that someone made on Teachers Pay Teachers. I take no credit for it, but I'm happy to pass it along if you'd like it. So the big question for the day, how is the Communication Bill of Rights impacted by CDI? How do all of these terms intersect? What are we here today to discuss? First, let's look at two that kind of go together. We're going to look at the right to request desired objects, actions, events, and people, and the right to refuse and reject undesired objects, actions, events, or choices. This is basically the ability to choose things, right? And the ability to say, no, absolutely not. <laughs> I am not doing what you have for me today. So what makes this right especially difficult to access if you have CDI? Well, we're going to start with something called form accessibility. So a lot of individuals with CVI struggle with visual recognition. They might not understand what they're looking at. And so when we do CVI assessments, we look at what kind of form is the most accessible for that student. Because some individuals with CVI are given communication systems that are not accessible to them. And so they're, give, they're not given the opportunity to make those meaningful choices, to say, I want that, I don't want that, no. Because the visual form itself is just inaccessible to them. Maybe they're not ready for 2D. Maybe they're not ready for abstract color images. Um, whatever it is, sometimes we design these beautiful communication systems and put them in front of the kid with CVI and they cannot access it uh, because of their CVI. So this area of assessment, when we look at form accessibility, we look at what is the most visually recognizable for the individual with CVI. Do they need 3D versus 2D? Are they ready for a single patterned object or a multi-patterned object? I have a picture of a tube of bubbles on the screen that's just green. And then I have another picture of a musical turtle toy that has multiple colors. Um, some students with CVI might not be able to look or look at or recognize something that has that much color in it. It might be too complex of a pattern and they might not be able to identify it as one whole object. They might think of the turtle as five different objects stuck close together because they can't put the pieces together yet. They might be more able to access photographs versus color illustrations, realistic illustrations versus abstract ones, color versus black and white. It's all individualized. And this is why we really need to peer down into what is the most accessible form for this individual. So there's a rough and very flexible continuum that is based in the literature, but really is individualized that typically for 3D objects, individuals with CVI often recognize a single color object first, like the orange pop bead that I have on the left side of the screen. Then they move on to more multicolored object, like the multicolored uh, pig toy that has a little coin bank on it to really patterned objects, like the really crazy zebra keyboard that I have up here that is multicolored and has lights and stripes and everything. But again, this adjusts with each kid. But familiarity and preference are also key to recognizing materials as well. So usually we recognize what we experience, right? This is true for all of us and it's true for individuals with CVI. We might recognize our own motivating objects first. Like maybe a student would recognize their own pink spoon on the left side that they see every single day before they recognize any other spoons, right? Then they would learn to recognize classes of objects. Know that any spoon is a spoon. Um, and I have some examples on the screen here of a spoon with a bendy handle, a scalloped, highly decorated silver spoon, a wooden spoon with a mustache cut, cut out of it. All of those might be difficult to recognize as a spoon if you only know your own purple spoon, because they differ significantly in the shape, in the color, in the patterning. So it takes time and it takes instruction for individuals with CVI to learn entire classes of objects. Um, and from there, we typically move towards 2D. And Matt Tejan has done incredible work in this area, looking at what kind of 2D form is most accessible. So we're going to dive into that a little bit. And the 2D recognition continuum, again, we need to go into assessment, but it roughly goes from realistic, from real photographs, like I have a picture of a crest tube of toothpaste on the left side of the screen, all the way through realistic color illustrations, realistic to abstract illustrations, um, I mean, color illustrations and then realistic black and white to abstract black and white at the end. Um, as you go, you lose more and more visual information as you go through these different kinds of 2D images. 
So what are most of our communication systems? Most of them are abstract color illustrations right in the middle. That might be inaccessible. That might be too hard for our individuals with CDI. They might need us to use as many real photographs as possible or as many realistic color illustrations. And if you go back 30, 40 years, our um, AAC systems were mostly abstract black and white. So we haven't done well in meeting individuals with CVI with the symbol sets that they need to communicate, or maybe they need to access words as well, like Ellen was talking about in her literacy discussion. So what kind of solutions do we have? How do we meet kids where they are so that they can make real choices and say no to real things by accessing a form that they can recognize? We need to work with the TVI, right? We need to work together to discover, first of all, what sensory channel is strongest? What is your strongest sensory channel? Are you an auditory learner? Are you a visual learner? Is touch more accessible to you? Because not all AAC needs to be visual. Two-step auditory scanning, auditory phishing, uh, braille to speech, these are all completely valid and robust communication options for you that are not visually mediated. And maybe that's what an individual with CVI needs. That's where you need that collaboration to identify what sense is really strongest for you. And if vision is their strongest sense, if that is their primary sensory channel, then we start where they're strongest because we need them to have access to their voice wherever they are. You might use 3D objects, real photographs. And I have some pictures of systems on the screen. At the top, we have uh, two switches hooked up with GoTalk Now so that if someone can scan through and do two-step auditory scanning. Um, then we have a screenshot of GoTalk Now with real photographs integrated into them with sensory choices on the page, like a slinky, a vibrating toy, or a bubble tube. And then on the bottom, we have a touch chat screenshot that has realistic color illustrations and a high contrast um, format for the accommodations. So we need to start where they're strongest, but we also need to grow a robust communication system so they can make those choices, so they can reject those things specifically. And it is a dance, let me tell you. Um, I want to just make you aware of some limitations. Not everything can be represented by a concrete photograph, right? We think about that core vocabulary that we want our students to learn, which is verbs and pronouns. And then our fringe vocabulary, that fringe vocabulary is like the nouns, the, the objects they want to choose, the things they want to reject, that's a lot easier to have a concrete photograph of than how do you have a picture of want? How do you have a picture of run? Especially if you have a student with CVI who can't see someone running. So in that case, we make the symbol as visually accessible as possible, and then you teach it. And that's what we're good at, right? We're parents, we're educators, we're therapists, we're good at applying meaning to new things. And that's what we need to do for those things that are more abstract. We need to integrate it into motivating routines, and we need to model without expectations. All right, let's move on to another right. Number five, the right to make choices from meaningful alternatives. So this is more of the same, but this kind of comes back to the idea of uh, behavior management really influencing the kind of communication options that people were given. Often, and it still happens today, we might not give the choices to our children or our students that we don't want them to have access to in that moment. But again, with a speaking child, we wouldn't put our hand over their mouth when they start asking to go outside when you know you don't want them to go outside. We allow them to ask and we say no. <laughs> but we need to allow them the chance to exercise that right to self-advocate because that is so foundational in building agency and self-advocacy skills. We need to let them ask for it. And then we need to set the boundaries and say, not now, sorry but you can try something else. But we need to allow them the chance to make those real choices. So why is this hard with CVI? Let's talk about clutter. <laughs> In CVI, there's this uh, phenomenon called the impact of spacing and clutter. And individuals with CVI can tolerate different amounts of visual background stimuli. They may need a reduced number of items presented at once. And closely spacing items together may impact visual recognition because of simultan agnosia, which is just a nice long word that represents that difficulty accessing clutter. And that simultan agnosia has a lot of research behind it, which is why we include it in our slides. Um, I have a couple of pictures here for some of my students who maybe can't really shift, can't look at multiple things at once in clutter, I might have a reduced array. So I have a picture of a screenshot of GoTalk Now that has bubbles and a wrapper snapper on it. And that's for someone who's really still just learning to look at more than one or two things at once. 
But below that, I have a screenshot of a high-tech device with word power on it. And I think there's like 20 icons on there. And let me tell you, that one was a little bit more clutter cluttered than I thought the student can handle, but she had incredible compensatory skills. She had really great motor planning and really good listening skills. So whatever she hit on the screen, she could listen to, and that helped her know what she was selecting. But these are two examples of just the spectrum, the array that we have within this demographic of people with CVI, that some can handle two, some can handle 20. It all depends on their lived experience. Um, a reduced array can reduce the number of choices that individual with CVI can make. And that is the tension. That is why speech therapists and TVIs don't always get along. <laughs> the TVIs want to take away options because it's visually overwhelming. The SLPs, we want to add more options because we need a robust communication system and we want that vocabulary to grow. And that is where we really just have to collaborate and work together and figure out what works for this kid. And how do we move together and have something that can grow with them, but that is truly accessible? And I got to say, a robust communication system is only robust if it's accessible in more than one room. If it's only accessible to you in your quiet, perfect little speech room, it's robust in there, but is it really robust if you can't access it when it's loud, when you're hungry, when you're in the lunchroom, when you're on the playground? Um, so we really do need to work together to figure out just what kind of clutter, what array can we put on a communication device that is not overwhelming, but has the room to grow to be really robust and strong so they can make those meaningful choices so that they can ask for things that maybe we don't want them to have right then. <clears throat> So what are some strategies? Sometimes we need to increase the spacing. That might mean increasing the array on a screen and masking a bunch of buttons or um, spacing them out. I had one student who was so social and all she wanted to do was talk to people. And so on her device, I had to literally program every single staff member in the lower school onto her device because if someone wasn't there, she would come to me, show me the device, point to the person and be like, where is my person? <laughs> she loved them. And so I needed to have, a real way for her to access a lot of information, a lot of names and a lot of photos. So what we did for her, we started with an array of 13. It was too much, it was just too much. It was basically chance. She was kind of tapping around, it's a little too much. Then we reduced it, the second screenshot, we reduced it just to just six faces and a couple buttons for navigation. And we just taught her how to scan across multiple pages at once. And she became so efficient at scanning through and finding the person she was looking for. So we realized she just needed a little more spacing for her fine motor skills and also for her visual access so she could access that amount of clutter. And this way she was able to interact with all the people she wanted to interact with. We also want to think about those compensatory strategies to help the learner with CVI access a higher array of options without relying so much on their vision. Maybe we take advantage of that motor planning and we teach them to just build a consistent motor plan for whatever it is they want to ask for or reject so that when they're tired and their vision is off, they're able to just rely on what their muscles know how to do. Um, LAMP Words for Life is one program that is exclusively built on motor programming. I got to say the pictures are weird. The icons they're built on are really a little abstract and out there. Um, but the whole system is built on motor programming. TD Snap Motor is another one that is built on motor programming and is a little bit, the, the pictures are a little bit less strange <laughs> and, um, and it's adaptable if you need to adjust the visuals to be real photographs or something like that. Auditory fishing, we're going to see a video of this, is where a student taps around on the screen and listens for the option that they want and then taps it again and says it. So they're able to use those auditory skills combined with those motor skills to find the options that they want. And auditory scanning, maybe back to that two switch scanning. Sometimes we just take away the visual component and we let them rely on those good skills. Sometimes we teach them to do it with a headset so that they listen to all their options in their ear. And then when they find the one they want, they hit the second switch and it speaks it out loud to all of you. So let's look at some of these options. Oh, one side note. We also want to look at the environment and the amount of clutter that's around you when you're instructing your students in your communication system, right? If you're teaching a new visual skill or potentially a new language skill, we want to limit the visual clutter in the environment. So I have a student here who is learning to do, oh, didn't advance the slide. I apologize. Do you mind clicking for me? Keep going. There we go. Um, let me make sure that this is working. Yeah, I'm going to need you to just do the slide for me. Thanks. Um, so this child was learning partner-assisted auditory visual scanning, and it was a little bit hard for him. We showed him one picture at a time on the iPad, and we said it to him. And if he wanted it, he would reach out and tap it. 
but this was a really visually demanding skill for him because he was still learning 2D access. So look at where he's facing. He's facing two blank walls <laughs> and there's no clutter in front of him. And that's because then he can focus exclusively on that one visual target in front of him and he's not distracted by the clutter behind him. And I gotta say in your homes, in your classrooms, in your therapy spaces, this can be so overwhelming to think about limiting clutter, especially when we've been told that putting words up on the walls and putting images up on the walls really helps our students or helps our children. It doesn't have to be perfect, but one trick that I've learned from Ellen Maisel, who worked in a CVI center here for years, who built it, um, was the two wall challenge. So just pick two walls, pick one corner and make that uncluttered, put all the other clutter behind them and then face your kid towards that, those two blank walls while they're doing something new that's visually challenging. And then all that clutter, all that stuff that we need for our daily lives is behind them. It's not distracting um, and you don't have to have a perfect Marie Kondo home. All right, next page. So we're gonna watch a video. This is auditory fishing at work. This is a student in our lower school. We have permission from his parent to um, see this video. Um, he uses, he has a really cluttered device and it's beautiful. <laughs> it's way higher than I would think he could access based on his visual skills alone. That's where those compensatory skills of auditory fishing really come in. So he taps around on different areas on the screen until he finds the option that he wants and then it speaks for him. Um, so he's using those really strong auditory skills to help him use a communication device so that he can do a literacy activity with chicka chicka boom boom. We're ready for you. Okay. A book. Chica chica. Coconut tree. Good job. That's right. Okay, your turn. Chica chica. A book. Chica chica. Chica chica boom boom. Will there be enough room? Here comes H up the. Go ahead. A book. Chica chica. Chica chica boom boom. Can you find coconut tree? So if you saw in that, or if you heard in that, he did kind of float around to different buttons, but he always found the one that he wanted because of that auditory feedback. So those are compensatory skills at work so that he can access way more vocabulary than his limited array would be visually. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is such an important right. We're gonna talk about the right to interact socially, maintain social closeness and build relationships. All right, this is challenging when we think about CDI because accessing people is one of the most challenging things when you have CDI. Individuals with CDI may struggle to make or maintain eye contact. They may struggle to visually attend to faces, to interpret facial expressions, to differentiate between faces and re recognize familiar faces. You may have heard of this as prosopagnosia. It's also common in the autism spectrum. Um, there's a number of people who have prosopagnosia. It's not limited to CVI, but it is common that people with CVI struggle to access faces. And individuals with CVI might struggle perceiving motion. If something is moving too quickly, it may be difficult for them to perceive it. I like to describe this as for those of us with typical vision, when you look at the propellers on a plane turning, at some point they disappear as they get faster and faster. If you have CVI, those propellers might disappear a lot sooner, maybe as soon as it starts turning. Um, so that can help you understand what it might be like when you're trying to look at something that's moving quickly. Think about how much of social communication is movement. How much of it is body language, gestures, and how quickly do facial expressions move? <laughs> so if you have trouble perceiving movement, you might not be able to ever read a facial expression, unfortunately, because they happen like that. They are so fast. Let's go to the next slide. So we have a couple quotes from individuals with CVI, just particularly about what can be challenging. Um, one young adult said, I can see everything about people except their faces. When I'm at a party, I'll see people, but I won't see their faces. So it's very hard for me to see who they are. A student with CVI said, I can't see pedestrians moving. I'm quite likely to bump into them. Or suddenly there's a person in my face and I'm still walking and I have no idea what to do to avoid them. So it can be very stressful to even just walk along a sidewalk. You can head to the next slide. So think about how challenging it can be um, to interact socially and to maintain that social closeness that we all desire and deserve um, when you have CVI. So let's think about some strategies. Individuals with CVI may benefit from being told who's in the room. 
and what they're using. If you walk into a classroom or if you walk into a living room, the person with CVI might not be able to see what their options are, who's there, who are they going to go talk to, what kind of centers do they have in their, um, in their kindergarten classroom. And uh, we might need to describe how to use tone and overall body language to help understand how someone is feeling. We might need to be taught explicitly about how to access those social cues. And then we really want to encourage those compensatory strategies to help recognize people. Maybe they learn to distinguish someone by their voice, maybe by the sound of them walking. We had one student that we recently assessed who said that two staff members looked alike and one was a six foot three man and the other one was a five foot two woman. And I said, tell me more about that. <laughs> How do they look alike? And he said, they make the same swish clot movement when they walk. So he identified them by sound, by how they walked around the building. Um, maybe overall height, hair color, glasses. Um, we want them to be able to identify who their friends are. What do they typically wear? Because they might not access their faces, but they can learn those things, right? And then we wanna create shared social opportunities that do not rely on vision to mediate them. How do we still encourage that connection that doesn't demand access to faces and facial expressions like Play-Doh or a seesaw? And I've got a bunch of examples for this. Next slide. Um, let's talk real quick about communication devices. Use of, of photographs of people on devices just should be carefully considered in assessment. 2D images of photographs are often not accessible. Um, you might want to do something instead that's like a personal identifier. I had one little girl who loved her mom and her mom always wore red lipstick. So we just took a picture of her mom's mouth <laughs> and it might feel a little weird, but it's a lot easier for her to recognize that image of her mom's red lipstick on her device than this whole complex face. Um, and we want to think about color coding based on the child's experience. Um, and if you think the student is recognizing photographs, if they're ready for that, just be considerate of compensatory strategies that they might be using in recognizing people, like depending on what color hair they are. Uh, I cut all my hair off at one point and I came into school and multiple of my students with CVI were actually really mad at me. <laughs> I came in and one girl said, you look like a boy. Why did you cut your hair off? And at first I thought she was just being snarky and kind of sassy. And, and then I realized she knows she's having a hard time recognizing me because she relied on that long blonde hair as a, as a cue to know who her speech therapist was. Next slide. Um, when we're thinking about communication development and milestones with CVI in mind, you don't want to expect eye contact as a language milestone. People often look for that as this milestone for something called joint attention. And joint attention just means you and I, we're focused on the same thing and we're sharing that experience together. And tell me how that needs to be visual. <laughs> There's nothing about that that needs to be visual. But historically, we've measured that by someone looking at the object, looking at their parents in the eye and looking back at the object. And that's one way to measure it. But we know from the neurodiversity movement that eye contact should not be the only way that we measure joint attention. So foster shared experience through other modalities. Look for other ways of sharing experience together, whether it's that the child reaches out to touch their mom while they're playing with a toy or laughing while you're dancing together, that's a shared experience. Think about these ways that can be touched, that can be auditory and still shared, that you're both thinking about the same thing, but you don't have to look them in the eye to share that. So here's some examples. We might want to use tangible symbols or personal identifiers for attendance in, in school, for um, designating who has which cubbies and for social groups. There are a couple of pictures on the screen. We've got one picture that has four cubbies. And at the top of them, we've got four different tangible symbols that represent each of the students in the class. So the students are able to either feel or look at those 3D identifiers to know, hey, that's my cubby right there. Um, on the next slide, we have uh, an early learning center in the deaf blind program. We have attendance. Oh, can you go back? Um, we have an attendance thing on the left side, their weather, um, and then what classes they have. And on the left side, those tangible symbols are, again, personal identifiers so that together they take attendance by scanning through those tangible symbols instead of having to look around the room to say, oh, everybody's here today. They can check them out with these alternative modalities. All right, next slide. You also want to position yourself in their best visual field because individuals with CVI have preferred visual fields. Um, and we want to honor their AAC needs and share object interactions. So on the screen, we have um, a few uh, students from that same classroom in the DeafBlind program. Um, one student is engaging in tactile sign with their teacher. The teacher's in their preferred visual field and is using what the kind of communication that they need, right? They need tactile sign, and so they're engaging with that with them. 
And in the other photo on the right side of the screen, there's a child smiling at the camera with his speech therapist, and they're doing a story box. They're checking out the objects together, and that's a shared social experience. They're sitting next to each other. They don't have to make eye contact, but they're checking out these objects and laughing about how silly they are, how fun they are. These are still shared experiences that don't have to be visual. All right, next slide. And for more examples of this, we want to we want to do really creative, physically shared social opportunities like going on a swing together. In the bottom right corner, we have two girls who are in kind of this long bucket swing and they're sitting there. They're kind of pushing their feet against each other's feet and they're giving each other a high five. And it's such a shared experience. And neither of them needs to look at the other person's face to share a laugh, to share an enjoyed experience together. Above that, there's something similar. We have three girls sitting on a bouncer, which is like a seesaw, but way less dangerous. <laughs> it's a lot more reduced movement and they're passing a ball back and forth. This was a really happy day. These students really enjoyed each other in that moment. Um, and again, you don't need vision to laugh together, to bounce the ball. Um, you might need a little bit of a help uh, catching them all, but that's fine. You can still share that physical experience of being on the bouncer together. And then the last big picture is a couple guys sitting um, across the corner of a table together playing with cars and Play-Doh. These are really tactile experiences. They can kind of feel what the other person makes. They can pass things to each other. Again, they don't have to rely on that facial expression to interact together. So get creative, get creative with these things. We've got a couple more. Um, Go with whatever is in season, get out there and play in the snow. Snow and snowball fights are highly tactile and you can rely on voices to know where to throw, toss things gently. We don't want anyone injured. Um, and uh, so we have this student with CVI who loved to get out in that freshly fallen snow and feel it and talk about it and pass it to their peers and maybe check it at a teacher. Um, and in this next classroom, we have a photo of four students with CVI who all have different mobility needs, different communication needs, but they learn in a classroom together and there's three teachers who are in there with them. And in this classroom, we have one core table right at the heart of it. And that table is the social hub of that classroom. And so the students know exactly where they belong. They know where their assigned seat is and they know where to find people. So having this defined social space that if you're ready to come talk to people, um, you can come over and sit at the table and share that experience. And they have other seating in the classroom. They have a couch along the window. They have um, standards. They have a couple of things um, that if they need a minute, if they don't want to have, if they're not ready for that social connection, they can go sit on those, but they know their social zone physically within the classroom of where to go in order to connect. So being strategic about how you set up your social interactions might be being strategic about how you set up your classroom space. Uh, and next we have a couple creatively shared social opportunities. I do not know what to call this toy, but it's one of those inflatable advertisers that goes on outside of car washes and it fills up with air and it kind of dances up and down. We have a little one of those that's switch operated and our students with CBI often love it because it's big and it's colorful and it moves and it draws your attention in. And if it hits you in the face, it kind of, it doesn't hurt. It's just kind of silly. And this is something that in this photo, two boys are playing with at the same time and they're laughing about it, they're sharing it. So sometimes creating a social opportunity means finding the right toy finding the right thing that's entertaining, that's engaging, that's accessible. And then on the next one, outside in Bradley playground in the middle of our campus, we have um, a spinning toy that you can sit on on a bench. There's also a place where you can roll a wheelchair on. There are a couple students laughing, enjoying spinning, enjoying that sensation. You don't have to have any vision to enjoy the sensation of a spin together to hold on to each other. So that is still a meaningful experience that those two students have and remember um, and no vision was needed. So let's go to the next slide. All right, the next right. These students have the right to access environmental contexts, interactions, and opportunities that promote participation as full communication partners with other people, including their peers. So in other words, we want these individuals to be a full and active member of their community and environment. So this is kind of a wordy one. We're gonna unpack it a little bit. Let's go on to the next slide. So in order to access your environment, to be a full and active member of your community, we often expect people to be able to see what's going around, on around them, to see things at a distance, to incidentally learn about who's in the room, what are my options at lunch on the table in front of me. Um, and so we look at this phenomena called visual curiosity. 
Visual curiosity includes the ability to attend to and understand visual information from a distance. And an individual CVI may lack visual curiosity for materials presented at a, dis at a distance, and they miss out on incidental learning, right? This is probably not a new concept for you if you're here at this conference. Um, but it is key that these individuals have a limited range of what they interact with, and so they miss anything beyond three feet or beyond five feet or more. Um, we need to consider the accessibility of the environment in light of difficulty with clutter, visual attention, visual recognition, and we need to figure out what is their preferred viewing distance, how close does something need to be for them to really inspect it and recognize it and understand it. So we have a couple images on the screen. One is of a beautiful little girl with CVI leaning really close to an iPad so that she can see it, and the other is people waving to each other from a distance. So next slide. So this is just a picture of a classroom from the internet. When I look at this with typical vision, I get a ton of information, maybe a little too much for my brain, to be honest. There's six desk pods. There's a red bin on every desk. There's the alphabet up on the wall. There's also a calendar. There's a whiteboard. There's a TV. There's a projector. There's a big bright wall of windows because I can see all the way 20 feet across the classroom. On the right, I put some occluders on part of the screen because an individual with CVI might not see beyond three feet. So the information that they get from that same experience is the desk and the chair and maybe a little bit of the chair of the first hub. So what do they miss? <laughs> they miss out on all these visual supports that help them organize their day, that, that give them incidental access to literacy resources. Um, so we need to think about how to help our complex communicators be full active members of their environment and their community when maybe they can't see beyond three feet. Next slide. So I have a video of this that is from years ago. Those of you who know Karen Barrows, she gave a talk on positioning earlier today. So she's letting me use this. Um, this student is walking for an iPad and the iPad is on a frame and it's really pretty close to him. It's maybe with, it's within a foot of him and he's really excited about that iPad and he's ready to walk with Karen's support because really what she wants is for him to walk. So look at how well he walks when it's close and then pay attention at the end and Kelly's gonna play it for us. and bloop, he just falls right over. So as soon as the iPad goes four feet away, it was really close. As soon as it's four feet away, loses all will to stand up right. It's just too far for him. Let's move on to the next slide. So what are our options? Uh, some strategies. Individuals with CVI may need multi-sensory access to their materials, right? Things that involve touch, sound, smell, whatever it is. Um, they may need extra time to explore unfamiliar materials and environments, anything that's outside of that range of visual curiosity. They may need explicit cues and teaching about what's happening around them. Who's there? What are they doing? What noise did I just hear? Next slide. And if we think about a communication system, um, we want to have pictures taken from that student's preferred viewing distance. So if for example, if I'm choosing photos for a device, I wanna take things from the range that they're used to recognizing things from. So instead of having a picture of a whole uh, swing set, and I have a student who can't see beyond 18 inches in front of them, I'm gonna go up to the swing and take a picture of it from 18 inches away um, and use that image because that's what their experience is. They might not have any idea what that weird shape of a swing set is. Next slide. All right, so there's another visual behavior that makes accessing your environment challenging, and that is integration of competing sensory input. So some individuals with CVI can't look and listen at the same time. They may struggle to use their vision when they're hungry, when they're in pain. They may struggle to look while experiencing textures or vibration. And really that's just a concern with feeling more than one sense at once and being able to integrate those lived experiences together. We need to be aware of that degree of competing sensory input whatever sense that is, that an individual with CVI can handle while using their vision. And this significantly impacts their ability to access group interactions and social experiences. Next slide. 
So again, if we're paying attention to CDI voices, this is from a blog from a teenager with CDI. They said, what people without CDI don't realize is that I only look at things when I absolutely need to. I don't like looking, it's taxing. Most of the time I can get the same information from my other senses. When I don't look at things because I'm using my other senses, it's not because the other senses are blocking out my ability to look, it's because I don't need to look anymore, so I don't. Um, so we're trying to listen to these experiences to know that there's different strategies for dealing with this issue with competing sensory input. Sometimes maybe they'll choose not to look and we need to give them the agency to do that. Next slide. So what are some solutions to this? What are some strategies? Individuals with CVI may need increased physical support to help them use their vision. Maybe they need a really supportive seating because if all their attention is going to stabilizing their core and keeping their body safe in their environment, then their vision is not as accessible. Where is the energy left for them to use on looking at whatever beautiful literacy activity you have in front of them or the meal time, the, the meal that you slaved over for hours? Um, they're not able to look at it because they're they're stabilizing their core and they're working hard. Um, so PTs and OTs are our best friends here. Think about what kind of supportive seating we need to encourage the ability to look. We might need to just use one sense at a time. We might need to let them look in silence and then listen. Um, and we might need to allow time to explore materials before sound is turned on if it's a toy um, or learning media. And we may need to uh, allow time to explore environments before others arrive. So think about how you time your transitions when you're going into your school day. Does your kid get to leave the, the class before five minutes early so that he can have a quiet transition um, so that he doesn't have a meltdown from being overstimulated by having to use his sound and vision at the same time? Next slide. And when we think about AAC, we wanna think carefully about whether your child can access their communication device in noisy places or where they're hungry or tired. And we talked a little bit about this already, um, but if, if not, I'm not saying don't use that communication system. We do need to have something that they're gonna grow into that's robust, right? Like we talked about, but maybe we need a supplementary system that they could learn to access easily. So I had a student where their parent programmed this page on a high tech device and we knew she needed to ask for a break every now and then and she could not access that yellow break button on the bottom of the screen and uh if you're not looking or you're not seeing it um there are multiple buttons on the screen there's about nine of them and for a student with cvi who's feeling dysregulated and needs to take a break those nine buttons were would not be accessible to her so we made a compromise we just made a break switch and there's another photo on the screen of a voice output switch with a bright yellow b that's tactile because it's a pipe cleaner um, and we just set that up right next to her so the student could just whack her heart, her arm over and hit that break switch when she was feeling dysregulated so we reduced the visual demand by creating a supplementary communication system to meet that need so that she can tell us hey i need a break <laughs> but we don't expect her to tell us she needs a break when she is dysregulated and disorganized and can't access the 2D screen in front of her. So we need to get creative and strategic about having multiple modalities for communication to meet whatever need your child has when they're in the lunchroom, when they're on the playground, when their AFOs are hurting their feet, whatever it is, we need to let them tell us in a way that's accessible to them. Next slide. We got a couple of videos here. Jalissa is a communicator who uses a high-tech device, but she also has some manual sign. And we're gonna have one video of her sassily telling me she really needs a break on the rocking chair um, and another video of her using her sign. So you can see there's different functions for different times. So in our first video, go for it, Kelly. Goodbye. I need a break. Rocking chair. All right, so the sound's a little bit in and out, but uh, we had just started working and she immediately sat down and said, I need a break give me the rocking chair, which was lovely. So you can see she really does use this high-tech device quite well, quite effectively to ask for what she needs. So let's go to our next video. And in this video, Jalissa is a little sillier. You'll notice her body is, or you may hear her voice is kind of going in a way that's vocalizing evening, excitedly. Jalissa. Her body is rocking back and forth. Um, and you'll see her use a sign or, you're, or I'll tell you she's using a sign. Nice. Right. So Jalissa's high tech device was available to her, but
But in that moment, she was telling me that's not what I need right now. Uh, she was silly. She's dysregulated. She was rocking around. And what was more accessible to her in that moment were those manual signs. So she could tell me, I want more of that, that beach ball. Keep it coming. Um, so what I want for my students with CVI is to have multiple ways to tell me what they need and what they want so that they can be um, active communicators and have access to their voice all day long. All right. This is the last one. You've been really true, uh, big troopers. We're getting there. Hang with me. Uh, these two go together. And this is the right to be treated with dignity and addressed with respect and courtesy. And the right to be addressed directly and not be spoken for or talked about in the third person while present. This is a really big one. I think this is something that we all fall into sometimes. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is a challenge, right? We talked about access to people and prosopagnosia. If someone does not make eye contact, we're less likely to involve them in a conversation if we have vision and we're used to that. Um, it's our responsibility to advocate for our children and our students and remind people to speak to them and not about them just because someone isn't looking at you. Um, and maybe just because they don't have really strong listening comprehension doesn't mean that they aren't listening. I have a lot of students who know their name and no tone of voice. So when they come out of a session and they hear someone saying their name and they hear anger in their voice, they hear frustration, they know they're being talked about in a negative way and they're not being spoken to directly. So I'd encourage you to involve um, your children, your students in your conversations, address them directly. Some, and I, I, fall into, I fell into this too when I was a speech pathologist in the lower school. Sometimes I would have a session with a kid and I would just be like, oh man, Jerry and I had a really hard day. <laughs> Um, but maybe I could turn to them and say, hey, Jerry, should we tell the teacher about what happened today? Um, I can say, I had a hard time today. And I think, Jerry, maybe you feel a little frustrated and I can involve them in that conversation. So it's a skill that I'd encourage all of you to get used to involving them and showing them you matter, your perspective matters. It's not typical for someone to be talked about in the third person in front of them uh, if they're a speaking communicator. So why would we make it expected for someone who has complex communication needs? It denies them some dignity. Um, and really, it just takes a little bit more effort by us to learn this different way of talking, but it's so doable and it gives such a key um, acknowledgement of their dignity and their inherent worth as equal members of their community. Next slide. So some closing thoughts. We are gonna have some time for questions or we're gonna get out early so you can hit the road. Um, our little ones with CVI work incredibly hard every single day. And the best solutions for them are collaborative, they're child-centered and are done with respect and humility. And as our children and students grow, we get to model these skills and empower them to develop, to develop their own self-advocacy, to know that they have access to these inherent rights. And the first step in advocating for your children's rights is to know what they are. So here we have them today for communication, and it's a reminder and hopefully an encouragement for all of us to pursue them. If we'll click through the next couple slides, just a quick plug, we have a conference on CVI in June. We'd love to see you there. Um, on the next couple, we have my work cited. And if you have any questions, the floor is open. <laughs> Any questions in the chat are welcome to our for our virtual participants. Any questions in the room? We have one question um, on chat. Is the CVI conference in June virtual or in person? It is in person, right? Yes. The plenaries will be recorded but it is, the majority is in person. Any other last minute questions online or in person? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming and thank yeah. you, Sylvia. Thank you.